that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is a special edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. I'm George Harvey. This is Tom Fennell. I'm trying to get my hand in there. <laughs> this, is, uh, uh, this is Tom Fennell. <laughs> Diego Angarita and, and Phil Cherry have come to us from uh, Co-op Power in Greenfield, Massachusetts, and uh, Co-op Power's subsidiary, which is called Northeast Biodiesel. And this is something which is uh, kind of exciting after how many years, Phil, Northeast Biodiesel has been kind of being pushed? It's been over <coughs> 10 years. Over 10 years. I, th I think we should start by explaining Co-op Power, and perhaps, Diego, sure. you would like to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So Co-op Power is a consumer-owned renewable energy cooperative. Right. And our purpose is to uh, supply our members with the products and services they need to get off of fossil fuels. And we have a philosophy that everybody, um, whether you're uh, urban, rural, suburban, whether you're high income, low income, middle income, whether you own your own home or whether you rent, you should have the ability to get off of fossil fuels. You should right. be able to opt out and have it be um, affordable. So we use economies of scale to be able to work with our members to help get them a five-year plan uh, to get as far off of fossil fuels as they can possibly go um, and as they can afford. So uh, because we're a co-op, our, our, our members are actually the owners of the cooperative. Right. You know, our, our primary goal is to serve our members with the products and services they need and they have democratic control um, over you know what we develop, um, we have a specific uh, intention to make sure that our cooperative is multi-race and multi-class. It goes back to our philosophy of making this available for everybody. Right. And we look at fossil fuel freedom in four uh, major categories, and that's electricity, uh, heating and cooling, heating your water, and transportation. Okay. And so our list of products and services. You know, sometimes it, it overlaps in any of those four categories. And the idea is that, you know, we're working with people. A lot of times they don't have the, the time or the attention to sit down on their computer and do like tons of research on how to work on this. You know, we've, um, that's our goal. Our goal is to make it really simple for, for members to understand first how to reduce um, their energy usage in those four categories and then to um, create renewable options. So, you know, our members out in Boston, you know, they have very specific needs and our members up in southern Vermont have very specific needs and in Western Mass have very specific needs. And so we're, we're very close to being able to provide um, a lot of, uh, of the renewable options. And I would say the one that's kind of our, the one we're trying to get over the hill on is, is biodiesel. Biodiesel can be used both to um, be mixed with home heating oil in heating systems and can be used in uh, diesel engines and vehicles for transportation. Where does biodiesel come from and how is it made and, and what are the side uh, uh, byproducts and things? Um, <laughs> Go for it, Phil. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, bio biodiesel in, in general is, is made from vegetable oils and animal fats. Uh, the purpose of, of our project in particular is to use recycled vegetable oils from the local community, restaurants and cafeterias and universities. Uh, but in general, you t uh, vegetable oil is uh, the lipids of the vegetable oil. You add an, an alcohol, uh, methanol typically, or you can use ethanol, and there's a chemical reaction that happens to produce a free fatty acid ester. I like to think of it as you, you're making soap and then you throw away the soap. <laughs> yes. <that's laughs> now this could be done by making making the um, the biodiesel directly from something like rapeseed oil or yes. or corn oil or something like that. Which so is typical for the very large biodiesel 
plants. They okay. use the virgin vegetable right. oils. Which, they're doing this in Europe right now. They're doing it a lot. In the Midwest. But of course, this also oils. means that you have a lot of fossil fuels that are going in there just for the purpose of raising plants for the purpose of making the oil, where what you're doing is you're taking recycled oil, which would otherwise be thrown away. Yes, yes. And, and what, what, what becomes of recycled oil if we allow it to be thrown away? Normally it goes to the landfill um, and is disposed of back into the ground of some okay. sort. And it's eaten by bacteria and, and turned and into and CO2 and, the, and uh, mm -hmm. methane. And, which means that what you're doing is you're, you're, you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere when this, when this biodiesel is burned. But it's but already it's, been taken out of the it's, atmosphere. It's going to go back into the atmosphere <laughs> yes. anyway. Yeah. And it could go back in as a, in the form of methane, which is considerably worse as a greenhouse gas than, than the carbon dioxide that it burns into as biodiesel. Yes, so biodiesel definitely reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, absolutely, it, it absolutely decreases greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions. So now, I think that's sounds very carbon point. neutral then. I think actually you could make a case that it's carbon it's, negative. It, it would be interesting just to look at the numbers and, and figure out what's going on there. Well, I'm sure it's been done already. We just don't know them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, w it would be interesting to, to see how that all works. Um, but there, there's a, you, there's a um, byproduct, which is glycerin. Yes. And what happens to the glycerin? Uh, the glycerin, glycerin is normally sold, uh, it, what's produced is a crude glycerin mm -hmm. and it needs to be uh, refined a little further for pure glycerin that's used in cosmetics and other types of industries. Uh, our focus is to work with the local municipalities and, and water treatment facilities and sell it to them to use as a uh, food source for the, the bacteria to digest in the... Uh, wastewater system. So it raises the efficiency of their system. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That's, that's very interesting. Now, the, the waste oil, which would otherwise go to the landfill, mm -hmm. um, is, is made into biodiesel with, with glycerin. Are there any other byproducts? No. no. So it just becomes diesel oil and, and glycerin. glycerin. The glycerin is a waste, but it's sold. Right. And it's sold to, uh, into a situation where it's going to be used and, and used in waste treatment. And then the biodiesel is, is something that a person can buy at the pump and drive his car around with. Right, or into the home heating oil. Or a home heating oil. Right. And it's functionally no different than uh, conventional diesel. No, functionally, no, functionally yeah. no. Not on a day-to-day -day basis, but my understand, understanding, Tom, is that it is very much kinder to the engine than, than the petrochemicals. Well, it could very well be. I'm not aware of that, doesn't have it the, doesn't have be. the sulfur content. Correct. Well, right off the bat, it's still... <laughs> <laughs> We're starting to see something yeah. that's getting better and better as it goes along here. Um, now, there's, there's also an economic side to this. Um, on the one hand, we could buy diesel oil, which would come from where? <laughs> someplace. Probably some, yes. mm -hmm. Huh? The Middle East. The yeah. Middle East. <laughs> it could be coming from, could be coming it, from, it, from Texas. Texas. It could be coming from wherever. Vermont, right. But it's, it's not coming from Vermont. It's no. not coming from Massachusetts. In fact, we can bet it's not coming from New England. Right. And, and so that money that pays for that is going out of the local economy. Yes. When you, when you buy biodiesel, you're buying a product that is made locally yes. by local mm -hmm. people. How many employees are you going to have? Uh, the, at full capacity, the plant will have 15. 15. So we'll okay. create 15 jobs. Okay. Yeah, that's significant. Now, that's 15 jobs in addition to the jobs that are created, building the plant, installing the equipment, installing the system that's required to get all the all the uh, oil to the plant the, in the system well, that's required. Absolutely, the jobs for collection, uh, yeah. biodiesel distribution. This is just 15 just jobs in, in the plant. plant. Right. And, and in total, do you have any idea of how many, how many jobs would be created totally, including all those ancillary jobs? I would say it's probably close to 100. Okay, so. so 100 people are getting, it, are getting to be employed in, the, in, the, in a just job a which prevents something from going to a landfill and keeps the money locally in our economy 
is there a bad side to this? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> It's a great investment. <laughs> it's a great investment. It's an investment in the local economy. It's an investment um, that that uh, is is bigger than those jobs because that uh, the amount of money. Do you ha do you have any idea? There's a multiplier effect. There. There's a multiplier effect. How many uh, gallons of biodiesel are you going to be making every year? Uh, Three point five million. Yeah. Three point five million. Do you have any idea how much those are going to be sold for? The sale price oh, of the price. Um, now that's a tough one to predict the price. It'll it'll we will market to, you know, the price of biodiesel with a discount to the co-op membership. It's so, going to be right now. So today's bucks about three bucks a gallon. Yeah. Two, so it's yeah. how much does how does that compare with diesel oil? Uh, it's. I'm not sure what the current price from, is. From my understanding, the the feedstock oil, the price of that um, follows the price of regular oil. So as that goes up, you know, the price of the feedstock goes up, and the price mm -hmm. of biodiesel goes up. So it's that's how the market fluctuates. It's going to have to be yeah. balanced to the market. Is the yeah. biodiesel? You're not going to sell it if it's too expensive. Is right. the, you'll sell too much if it's too cheap. Yeah. <laughs> is the biodiesel more expensive or less expensive if a person if a person joins Co-op Power? Just for the purpose of buying biodiesel for his Mercedes, is that is that going to save him money, or is it going to just is he going to have the thrill of knowing that he's getting a really great oil and, and helping the environment? And you know, or it normally sells at a premium price. At a premium price, Typically so it's a little bit yes. a little bit more little expensive. Bit more. But well, as you I can buy biodiesel right now in Brattleboro at the pump, and it's a slight increase Extreme. over petrol diesel okay. in the same gas station. In the same gas yeah, station. Yeah, you, know, you, you got your choice. Hmm. Where is that? Up by the shell up on Canal Street. Ah, okay. Everybody. It's not here. Not his biodiesel. <laughs> That's his okay. Biodiesel. That's okay. I think it's only uh, twenty percent. I don't think it's pure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think it's pure bio. But you can run on pure bio. Oh sure. Yes. Oh absolutely. Is that engine yeah. doesn't know the difference? Now you you said that you were going to be you were going to be doing a, a twenty percent mix with a home heating. Oh, yeah. Oil. But is the biodiesel also going to be a 20% mix, or is it going to be It'll 100%? It'll be between 5 and 20 to 100%. It'll really depend on the, the target markets of where we set our stakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the, the, the vegetable oil, do you, do you, have you ever traced back to find out where that comes from? Uh, like where it's grown? Yeah. Um, I mean, I probably, I have no idea. I've never <laughs> traced. I'm not well, going to It would depend on which oil is used. Um, I would I'll make this assumption: if it's soybean oil, it's coming from the Midwest mm -hmm. and the soybean right. farms. Right. Uh, most of the canola oil is Canadian grown. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it cotton could, oil would it be. It could Texas. be grown in the Pioneer Valley, though. If it, if worst came to worst, we could grow our own oil. Yes, I understand. There was a study done many years ago, two or three years ago, to look at growing canola in this region for a, a, a biodiesel type project to press. I think it was focused on ag side, you know, to give the farmers something else to grow, and then you could process the canola seed, you could press the oil and sell it as a vegetable oil or process it in the biodiesel. Mm -hmm. well, and then fine, the feed off the press, that is cattle feed. Or there's some fine farmland in the Pioneer Valley. Which and used to be used for tobacco. Used to make tobacco, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just the, the wrapper leaves for cigars. Can you imagine that? How, <laughs> how big that industry must be to take all those farms for just cigar yeah. wrapper leaves? Well, the, the market yeah. is, is evaporating. People yeah. aren't smoking yeah. that many cigars. and uh, So the farmers are looking for, for alternative crops. And corn might work. I mean, a lot of it's being done for silage for cattle. Yeah. I don't know that many, many people are, buying, are, are growing market corn for, for food, but uh, you, you drive down there and you see a lot of corn farms, but they're those nice big ears, you know, that look good and taste terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Cows like it. Yeah, I mean, Cows like it. Yeah, you know, the, the, one of the things that comes to mind as, I, as I'm hearing about this is if a farmer were, were growing um, canola or peanuts, peanuts or whatever it is that he wants to grow and saying, uh, I don't want to make this into biodiesel. I just want to make it into, I just want to sell cooking oil. Mm -hmm. And it's being sold as food cooking oil. It gets used as food cooking oil. Yes. And then, then, it, then there's then a lot surplus. of waste. Yeah. There's a lot of waste from that, right. which can be it's used. It's not even waste, it's surplus. It's surplus. Yeah. It's, it's waste from, from <laughs> restaurants. 
and that can be processed into biodiesel. So this could be part of a chain, and and it means that this that the that the oil can be used and then reused when it gets gets to your car, and that could actually be part of a, a part of the local economy. Mm, is the production yes. for for first food and then and then and then automobiles. This is. It's really interesting to, to me to see how that all fits well, in. Well, it could easily develop because you're not going to have to transport the oil thousands of miles. You're well, the transportation locally, you're is going to use it in local, local restaurants. Yeah. You're it's a collect very it again. important is a very important part of, of yeah. the renewable energy thing. The idea that we can produce our own power, that we can produce not only our own power, but we, we can produce our food, we can produce our power, we can have an interdependent system of things. And that all fits into um, a, a sustainable economy, which is a local economy. It, it provides for a level of re resilience that is just beyond what, what you know, we might otherwise mm -hmm. think. I think long-term economics is going to go in that direction. I think it probably mm -hmm. will. But I'm just, one of the point that I'm making ultimately is this is not just ancillary jobs in picking up oil from, from drop-off points. Or restaurants. This is ancillary sure. jobs that goes through the restaurants and all the way back to the farm. If that's yes. if that's yeah, how yeah. you want to do it. Mm -hmm. So this is this really is you you know if the if you're making three and a, did you say three and a half yes, thousand three and a half million million gallons a year, and assuming those cost two dollars a gallon, we're talking well over seven million dollars yes. that would otherwise evaporate out of the economy. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. I think also um, another aspect to think about is how much fun it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, I like you, this. you know, we're, we're connected with other communities who've been doing biodiesel um, projects like this on smaller scales, um, you know, across the United States where they have member pump stations in Baltimore and they have, um, you know, a buying co op in North Carolina. And we've been doing these dinner clubs, um, at going to all the different restaurants that are participating with us and bringing our members out um, as a thank you for them, you know, being linked up with our project. And, you know, we have a, a speaker that talks about a renewable energy topic and our members just love to come out and, you know, eat food and knowing that, you know, they're part of something <laughs> that's, that's a cycle that's, you know, part of the local economy. It's very... Uh, identity, you know, base. It's like this is our region in the Northeast and, you know, we're really taking ownership of um, making us, you know, very independent. It's very new, much New England values of like, you know, self-sufficiency. And helping each other. Yeah. It's so you're going to have a way of identifying the restaurants that are supplying. Oh, yeah. You have like a logo in the window and stuff like that. People yeah. are going to recognize that and... Uh, I'm seeing this stuff. I'm seeing this all pulled and there's, pull there's it together. A list on Co-op Power's website, mm -hmm. at Northeast Biology, both websites have mm -hmm. a list of the restaurants that are participating. That are already so. If you want to know, recycling their best oil mm -hmm. into yep. uh, the project. You know, it's restaurants and schools mm -hmm. and like municipalities and as well. Municipalities. I mean, that's that's probably a really um, uh, untapped resource that you know we're starting to work with our members on is. How do you organize with your municipality to do um, the oil collections at the recycling facility? Uh, there's a few out there that, that are doing it. In Holyoke, Massachusetts, you know, when folks um, drop off their recycling at the recycling center, they can put their, their waste cooking oil in, um, in an old coffee can with a plastic lid and bring it and then empty it out into, um, uh, what do you call it, like a, a barrel? Mm -hmm. And so then um, once it fills up, the recycling facility guy just calls up, you know, the, the waste oil collector and they come and pick it up and that oil is going to end up uh, being turned into biodiesel. Mm -hmm. So if any of this winds up in a landfill, it's not going to wind up in a landfill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or yeah. at home, people just dump it right down their drain. Yeah, they do. Yeah. 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 And, and which which means, causes problems. Yes. It which <laughs> it goes to the municip municipality, municipality right. and wastewater treatment plant. Wastewater treatment plant and the uh, glycerin using <laughs> yeah, the right. bacteria yeah. 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 eats it up again. Yeah. But it's very expensive. You know, I, I had a conversation with United Water um, in Holyoke about this a number of years ago, and they were, you know, it cost them a lot of money to, you know, have to deal when people put their waste oil down the drain. So. You know, they were really supportive of Holio creating um, a waste oil collection uh, system for people.
that's that's you know one of the things Tom and I Brattleboro has a very unusual government, and the, what they, <laughs> <laughs> well, we we have a select board, but we also have a, um, a town meeting, and the town meeting is not just all the citizens going. The, there, they, there are special citizens called legal voters. Everybody else is an illegal voter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, these, these people are elected. The legal voters are elected by the rest of the, of the okay. uh, citizens. There's about 140 of them. Is that right? That's close. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's about, about 140 people meet. Tom and I are both members of the town uh, representative town meeting. And one of the things that we have had to deal with, and it has gone to the state level now, uh, not because of Brattleboro, but it's something that we've had to deal with through the years, is the, the municipal waste. And it's very clear that municipal waste is a very serious problem. We are paying more and more and more and more and more money. And it's costly. It's expensive. Yeah. And it's got to get from Brattleboro, the, the nearest landfill is where? In New York? I think it's up near Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks. Okay. Where the heck? It's, it's far a away. long ways away. It costs a lot of money to truck it there. The tipping fees, which are the cost per, per ton to get rid of it, are huge. And, you know, the, the, just throwing oil in that's valuable and a lot of other things that are valuable. There are a lot of things that are valuable that are thrown away as waste. Throwing that oil in there means that somebody has to truck it to Saranac Lake or something like that and then dump it into a landfill and it has to be paid for by the community through the taxes, which means that you throw that away and the tax money's being thrown away. You throw it down the drain and the tax money is being thrown away. This is, you know, what you guys have been saying. You throw it into a receptacle where it's going to the local co-op powers, Northeast Biodiesel's um, recovery, recycling, what, what would you call it, plant, um, and it becomes a, an asset. Yes, if it becomes a feedstock for biodiesel. Have you thought about other things that could be that could be done along those lines? I mean, if you if you're making biodiesel, you could make a lot of other things too. Yes and no. I mean, we've had some discussions, but really the focus has been to bring to bring this project to fruition and get it started. It's mm -hmm. been in the making for ten years now, and mm -hmm. there's been a lot of dedicated, uh, committed people that have hung in there for many many years, and we're really looking forward to commissioning the plant. Mm in the next few months and making the first batch of biodiesel and distributing it back into the co-op. I have to say this, working on this project, it takes, it's taken a lot of community tenacity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, co-op power was, you know, looking to launch this plant pretty quickly. We were in negotiations with a venture capital firm um, for several months when we had a grant to, to do the negotiations. And once the grant ran out, you know, the firm said, well, we know you guys don't have any money, so we're going to take over this plant, and then after two years, we're going to sell it for scrap. Wow. And that's just, oh boy. we have the resources, <laughs> and that's what's going to happen. <laughs> and the members were really faced with this decision to, you know, take the VC money and launch the plant, or continue it on a, voluntarily, on a voluntary basis, um, but have more ownership. And democratically, the members voted to reject the VC money and go on the path of, you know, volunteer stewardship. And that was a bold decision. It's it's bold. And yeah. it speaks to the, you know, um, the integrity of, of the membership. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that that was a really big lesson for the cooperative. And so one of our core values is who owns it matters. And that's something we apply to um, every product and service that we come across. So when we, we look at solar energy, we look at um, energy efficiency, whether we look at you know, different types of renewable technology, you know, that piece is so essential that our members want to make sure that we own it and understand what does ownership actually mean? Do you have a democratic say in what's happening? Mm -hmm. um, do you have uh, voting power? Do you have decision-making power? Is there someone you can actually show up at the office and talk to if you have questions about it. You know, we see the same thing with renewables uh, in different types of technology where people come from out of state to take advantage of um, state rebates and incentives. And, you know, they leave with a lot of benefits and, you know, we get things done, but we're losing that opportunity to actually own the means of production. And biodiesel, it's, a, it's that opportunity that, you know, 
in July, we're going to launch the plant. We're, we're fundraising right now. We're, we're asking folks to join Co-op Power. Um, that the equity will help us to launch that plan, making current members and new members to make member loans. Because we are a, com, a consumer-owned cooperative, we can leverage member loans to, to fundraise and finance this business. Um, and so that's, it really is, at the end of the day, us building it um, together as a community and, and launching this real asset. Biodiesel is a really great transition fuel. Um, in terms of uh, vehicles, you know, when we look at uh, all the construction that's going on over the summertime, those construction vehicles are running on diesel. Um, farm equipment runs on diesel. Uh, people have cars that run on diesel. If we were to just take all those vehicles and chuck them into a landfill and replace them all with um, electric vehicles that won't actually reach the horsepower we need to move snow or to um, do that kind of construction, um, we've just we have we just chucked a bunch of metal into a, a landfill somewhere. It's that's, called embodied energy. Yeah, and so that's we haven't actually made any improvements. Biodiesel, on the other hand, it moves us away from um, fossil fuel extraction, where we dig deep into the earth. You know, are contaminating ecosystems and poisoning animal animals and um, releasing uh, carbon and methane that's been trapped for millions of years into the atmosphere. Poisoning people too, by the way. Poisoning people as well, <laughs> you know, and we have all the accidents. You look at what happened with the oil spill, the BP oil spill down in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I know what just happened like yesterday in California. In California, exactly. And so um, with biodiesel, we're moving from that uh, long carbon cycle to a short carbon cycle where you know, we're staying on the surface of the earth. We're, use, we're making oil from um, agricultural crops that we're then using in food products and then taking that waste product and turning it into energy. And then, uh, like you were saying, that carbon dioxide is going to be released whether it's sitting in a landfill or for using for biodiesel. Right. And then, you know, we can sequester that carbon again. But by keeping it on the surface of the earth, we're doing a lot less damage. Right. Um, as technology improves, you know, we'll be able to innovate our biodiesel plant and um, Add, make additions, produce new things, but where we are in point at a point in time um, in time right now, biodiesel really facilitates us to um, stop extracting, stop right. putting ourselves at risk. Well, there's there's something that I'd add to that, and that is, there's a lot of people who object to the idea of using bioethanol. I was extremely disappointed with bioethanol when I first got it because I was driving a Prius. I was very aware of what was happening to my gas mileage. I knew that this new 10% bioethanol fuel that I had had a lot of, a lot of um, petrochemicals going into the manufacture of mm. bioethanol. In fact, about as much as you were getting out in bioethanol. There's no real improvement there. The thing that really bugged me, though, was the fact that when they put 10% bioethanol into the mix, I got 10% less mileage. Mm. So it was a net, it was a net <laughs> loss to go to bioethanol. But there are a lot of people who object to bioethanol anyway because it's destructive to the land. It uses, again, fossil fuels to, to get the, the non-fossil fuel. It's basically, there's a lot going on there that is destructive. What you're doing with, with biodiesel is not raising a crop specifically for the purpose of running a car or or fueling a home. What you're doing is using something which is left over from the food production that we were using, we're using as human beings who eat, who need that food, and then using that. And that is, I think, a very different thing from raising crops or, or cutting down forests or whatever to get the carbon. Specifically for energy. Specifically for yeah. energy. It's a very different thing and it has to be judged on a different scale. But it's something that would be produced anyhow. Yes, that's it's right. It's being produced, it's being used, and it's being tossed. Yes. yes. And we're grabbing it and turning it into something useful again. And you, realistically, if a person's going to fry fish in peanut oil and then eat the fish, is he going to drink the peanut oil? Right. <laughs> 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 it might taste a little fishy. <laughs> <laughs> it might. <laughs> okay, you've got a you've got a video. Yes. Can we can we <clears throat> see it? Sure. Northeast biodiesel is a recycled oil biodiesel plant 
here in Greenfield, Massachusetts that's been started by people here in the community who wanted to do something about renewable energy, about fuel security, about self-reliance, and about community ownership of the things that we depend on. To me, it is an idea, a concept, where you want the people, meaning the employees, uh, the residents of the surrounding area, to actually own the means of pr producing energy. Northeast Biodiesel is kind of a big experiment, really. It's, uh, it's trying to figure out if a community can come together a whole lot of individuals rather than one central uh, corporate effort and, and find a way to take control of their own energy needs. Biodiesel is made from 100% waste vegetable oil, friolator oil, right out of the grease dumpster, if you will. This waste product is then taken to the biodiesel plant and turned into biodiesel, which can be used in any oil heat system or in any diesel engine. We've bought a, uh, a reactor, uh, a biodiesel reactor called Green Fuels, and um, that one works pretty much continuously, seven days a week. Uh, 24 hours a day. Put oil in and you get biodiesel out pretty much gallon for gallon. Our biodiesel plant is going to produce 1.75 million gallons of biodiesel a year. And our factory is set up that within one year we hope to have a second one of these reactors and then we'll be making three and a half million gallons per year. At the beginning we will only have a few restaurants that we're collecting from and we're going to be buying the recycled oil that we need in the market for that. It'll come in in tanker loads, but over the next three to five years we really hope to be building up our, our local collection process. Co-op power, uh, it's, it's ownership structure. It's, it's set up so that those that have the most uh, skin in the game have the greatest uh, ownership. Northeast Biodiesel is a limited liability corporation that for the first 10 years will be owned by investors, by co-op power representing the consumers, and by its workers. After 10 years, we'll be buying out the investors and it'll be 70% owned by co-op power and 30% owned by the workers. It's been interesting that you know, we're, we're doing this during uh, one of the worst economic recessions of, uh, uh, in, you know, since the 1930s. And so we haven't been able to get bank money and others to uh, make this happen. And a good idea that, that we've come to is, is uh, member loans. Recently, we've started a new fundraising campaign, um, which has been our member loan drive, which offers the members of Co-op Power the ability to invest in the project through a member loan. This program has been very successful and has been the catalyst for us to be able to move forward with the project. My old 27-year-old uh, uh, Benz runs so much smoother. Uh, I can smell the difference. You know, it runs like a top when I mix in biodiesel. I drive a 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit diesel and it's converted to run waste vegetable oil. When I can, I choose to run it on biodiesel. Uh, as, a, as a starter uh, because I think that biodiesel is a better fuel than petroleum diesel. Uh, it's better for the environment. My car runs better on it and it has less emissions coming out of the back end so it smells a lot better. We're a biodiesel family. Uh, my wife drives a biodiesel fired car. Uh, I drive a truck. I have a tractor and an excavator uh, and a generator. They all run on, on biodiesel. What we're doing is we're making a sustainable product and that product is going to work in existing infrastructure. Nothing has to be changed, nothing has to be tailored. It doesn't only work during the daytime or when the wind is blowing. It's something that can be used every single day and it can make a difference. So being able to, to use our waste vegetable oil in a more responsible way and then being able to create fuel that's better for the planet and for people. The only thing that doesn't make sense is why we're not doing it in a much bigger way than we are. I'm really excited about Northeast Biodiesel. Well, first of all, just because so many people wanted it to happen. And um, our cooperative held you know, meetings for a couple of years to figure out what to do. And everyone agreed unanimously that this was the plant we wanted.
You um, are in a fun drive. We are in a fun drive. We have a June 1st deadline. Oh, that's not very far away. It's yeah. not very far away. So we've been doing um, a phone-a-thon calling up. Uh, we have a huge list of folks who've been saying that they're interested in membership and calling them up and asking them, you know, now's the time to join. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your member benefits will help you get off the of fossil fuels, but your member equity will help us launch this plant, which will have a huge impact for our region. Um, <clears throat> and so we're asking folks, you know, if you have that mission and core values alignment with us, you know, take the plunge and join. It really is about uh, everyone coming together and using those economies of scale. Um, <clears throat> right now we have about 500 members and around 7,000 supporters. And in the last election, those are the way I think about it. In the last election in Massachusetts, we had 80,000 people vote on the Green Party ticket. So we know that there's at least 80,000 people in Massachusetts alone that are very mission aligned with us. Yes. And so, you know, it's every, if everyone throws the weight behind um, our cooperative, we can really take control um, and, uh, in a sense, personally divest from fossil fuels. You know, it's, right. we're doing this. We're, we're taking these amazing examples that we've seen happen overseas and apply it to New England, to Vermont, um, to Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, and we're, we're also a decentralized uh, network of community energy co-ops. So we've got co-op power, but we organize um, so that each region can uh, make b uh, decisions about what they, what they need for, for their own members. In um, Vermont, we have um, a community energy co-op. You want to get this up, up yeah, on the screen? We yeah, we have a community energy co-op um, in Brattleboro that actually um, came together and financed the solar panels that are sitting on top of the Brattleboro Food Cooperative. And so our members came together. Um, they really wanted to do a community solar project. Um, the food co-op uh, was you know uh, being built and um, they needed support be to be able to put these panels on the roof and so Co-op Power actually owns the panels on the roof of the Brattleboro Food Cooperative. Okay. okay. <clears throat> cool. And so you know this was a really big value for Southern Vermont and in uh, Hamden County in um, uh, Massachusetts jobs are a really big issue. You know job creation was the um, biggest priority and so Co-op Power uh, collaborated with two nonprofits um, and created Energia, which is a commercial scale energy efficiency uh, uh, company. And so it's really, you know, there's a worker ownership component to it. And last year they closed their books at, I think, at about $2 million in revenue and a $300,000 profit. And they distributed $100,000 of that profit. And Co op Power got a, got a portion of it because of our investment in in that um, company. But the, the main goal of that was to create jobs. And we created, uh, I think, like 26 jobs in Holyoke for uh, low-income, at-risk youth to be able to work in, in this industry. And so it's, it's about working on a community level to be able to provide our members with some pretty universal uh, needs. And biodiesel is going to be that thing that, across the board, allows us to um, transition off of corporate-owned fossil fuels. Now, have you have you thought about, um, for example, how much of the petro the petroleum-based diesel or or diesel and home heating fuel could, in Massachusetts could be replaced if this process was emulated elsewhere in the state or in New England, for example? Sure, I'm going to let Phil answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> That's sneaking your way out of yes. it. Well, actually, you know, the last it would be reasonable to say no if you have, haven't, but we could speculate about it. Um, I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, and I apologize, but it, I want to say it's, no, I don't want to say. I'll say it might not, it might not be. I want, I'm thinking like 200 million gallons of, of diesel fuel in Ma Massachusetts alone. 200 million gallons. I believe. Is, 200 million gallons of diesel fuel means... The diesel fuel burns into about, I don't know, what, 22 gal pounds of, a gallon of carbon dioxide? That's my recollection. Yeah, that, that. And 200 million gallons, we're talking about, we're talking about um, 4 billion pounds of CO2 
Yeah. That's a lot of CO2. And that might be the New England number I'm thinking of. I, I, That's a lot. I apologize for not It's okay. That. It's okay. The, the, the real point here, because nobody knows what four billion is. You know, our, 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 our watches out there, four billion, four million. It's, it's, it's a difference. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you remind me of, Tom? There's a, there's a group of people I read about, I think they're Australian Aborigines, and they have a very simple binary numerals, num, numbering system. Yeah. They don't have a zero, hmm. despite the fact that it's such a lovely number. <laughs> they don't have a zero. They have one, two, one and two, two and two, one and two and two, two and two and two, one and two and two and two, and a heap. <laughs> 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 really... You know, it's not just these Australian <laughs> aborigines. That's what I should have went with. There's a heap of diesel fuel is burned every diesel. year. That's right. <laughs> I think most people, you know, seven is if picture seven is something, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to picture five, but picture seven is hard for anybody, you know, including mm -hmm. my daughter who's working on her PhD in philosophy. <laughs> Birds are better at it than we are. Are they? Yeah. They count eggs and stuff like that. Oh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> anyway, the the point is, there's there's a lot out there. What you're talking about is is getting f how big is your how big is your area that you're getting fuel from? Uh, it's Greenfield and then the Franklin County. Franklin County, yeah, yeah. So it's a portion of what you could get out of Massachusetts. Yes, and it's probably a larger amount than we could get out of Wyndham County, simply because you've got a. a greater population. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, um, these kinds of things can be done almost anywhere where people eat. Yes. Absolutely. So probably not the North Pole because there's no, no eating spots <laughs> there. But, you know, South Pole, they might have them. <laughs> and, um, but the, the, th the thing that I find really exciting about this is the multiplier effect in the economy and the fact that it can render an area self-reliant sustainably so um right the, the the concept is the community biofuel cycle right and it's to you know uh frequent a restaurant and have their you know bring generate more income for them they're right producing a waste product so eat out everybody <laughs> bring that waste product in to produce right. the diesel but the biodiesel that can go right back into the community so it's really within the community the community right. business the community supporting those businesses the community recycling a waste and the community having a, a renewable fuel right but you're going to have drop-off places where people can take their yes. own oil from their own kitchen mm -hmm. put it in and and kind of donate that to the to the well-being of the of the of the community that they're in. Now, you're, you're out making, doing fundraising. If somebody who's watching this, for example, um, wants to participate in that, how would they go about doing it? So, uh, I would... I'm up now. Oh, you? great. Yeah. So, um, you can become a member, first and foremost. Uh, membership is $975. Um, you can pay for that over the course of two years or um, a lot of people just do it in one in one payment, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you go on our website coopower.coop, that's c o o p dot oh c o o p p o w e r dot c o o p with no hyphen. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, links up there where people can download a membership form no. and and sign up. Now you say it's how much? So it's $975 for a standard membership. But you can do that in two years. You can pay for that um, over the course of two years, yeah. And that translates into about $40 a month? I, yeah, <clears throat> I believe so. Um, is, that a, is that two annual payments or is it monthly payments or what? Um, monthly payments. So for $40 a month, I could, I could join... Yeah. Um, Co-op power. Is there, are there any special breaks to needy people who are over 110 like me? <laughs> <laughs> so for folks who are um, uh, limited resource, and, and we count that as you have assets less than $100,000, that doesn't include the value of your home. And does you, not include. It them. does not include the value wow. of your home. That's and everybody in Wyndham County. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone in Wyndham County should join and become a member. It'd be, it'd be really great. <coughs> and if they have a, an income of less than $30,000 a year, um, you can get a, a limited resource membership, which is $500. 
And if you're a farmer, which means that you, you generate more than $2,000 from an agricultural business, um, you can get a, a farmer membership, which is $750. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a person who is, you say, special needs, I would be able to join for $500, which would be, can I do that in two years? Yeah. So that is $250 a year, and that translates into just a little bit over $20 a month. Yeah, um, you know, we can even, for the limited resource one, we can do that over the course of five years. $100 a year? Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's quite a deal. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's like eight, eight dollars and change a month. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, we're really committed to making sure that you know, we're as accessible for everybody because it's, it's not going to take only the wealthiest people transitioning where they get their, their energy from to you know, have an impact on climate change. It really right. is going to take everybody. Right. This is the kind of thing that I could see a person who is a, a conservative Republican libertarian getting very excited about because it means that he can power himself. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is, this is a, a um, it, it, I, I have friends of that, of that description and it's, it's something that I kind of enjoy. Hmm. The, the, um, so you're raising money. How much money do you have to raise? We need to raise about 800,000 more dollars. And this is, by the by the first of june yes so the, we're in a big push in a big push yes. can you this when did the push start 10 years ago <laughs> <laughs> i know but the, the eight hundred thousand dollar push um we finished the process engineering design and, and we made some modifications and that ended uh, about the uh, middle of april or so so the last month or so so you are now about 80 percent of the way through that eight hundred thousand dollar push how's it been going I've uh, been fairly well, I would say. From, well, from the, the so you, you have a real shot at doing this. Absolutely. We've been building up the momentum. And, yeah. you know, right now it's we've been doing all of our phone calls, getting interest members who want to loan um, between $500 to $200,000. Um, $200,000? Yeah, I mean, members are, they really want to see this project happen. And so, you know, like in a community, you're going to have folks who are, have a lot of assets. I mean, not everyone walks around town talking about their assets, but you know, people do have that. Mm -hmm. um, but also, not in Wyndham County, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's also about just getting the word out. You know, yes. getting more folks to join and become members to uh, strengthen our cooperative. You know, we could. Right. You know, once we to achieve that goal, their, their cooking oil. Yeah, once we. <laughs> even that. Op <laughs> opening this plan is going to put our our region um, on the map. We've done something that we haven't seen anywhere else in this country. Where it's you know we've seen biodiesel buying co-ops, we've seen solar co-ops. Right. To see something that's as comprehensive, that's as committed to. Um, you know, the the social justice component, making it accessible to everybody. We haven't seen that yet in this right, country. Right, And what we have seen a lot of is uh, plants of various kinds, particularly in the Midwest, Iowa and so forth, that are commercial. They take advantage of everything they can take advantage of in order to make money. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing here is, no, you know, nobody's talked about how much money the co-op power, uh, co power is, is going to get out of this. Uh, in fact, I haven't heard either one of you talk about how much money is going to be going to the owners of mm. Co-op Power. Well, who owns Co-op Power? <laughs> okay, it's kind of like, uh, it r reminds me a little bit of Milo Minderbinder. You remember him, Tom? Very, very Catch vague. 22. Very, very vague. Catch yeah, character yeah, in yeah, Catch, yeah, Catch yeah. 22. He went around saying that he would, he had Milo Binder Enterprises. And, you he know, was the entrepreneur. Kind of entrepreneur, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> He'd take an American bomber and, and paint Milo Binder, Minder Binder Enterprises insignia on it <laughs> and fly it to to Poland to, to buy <laughs> Polish sausages that he could then, you know, and it was back and forth. He even got to the point where he, he leased planes from the U.S. government so that he could uh, so that he could hire them out to the German government in order to bomb the air, <laughs> air base they took off from. But his his deal was everybody owns a share. But in your case, anybody really could own a share. Yes. And um, in his case, of course, it was just it was a scam. He was the guy who controlled everything. But in your case, it's how you know what happens if co if if uh, Northeast Biofuel makes a lot of money. 
It goes to the members. It goes to the members. The ownership slide you had. And you can't own more than one share? An individual. An individual not, has an yeah, individual. Has their share. Has um, their share. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, well, the, way, the way it's been working is that members usually join as um, households. So, you know, a lot of the benefits go to your house and your life. And so you can share your, um, your membership with uh, other people in your household. Yes. Um, in terms of voting, you get one vote per, per House, membership. Yeah. Yeah. Per household. Yeah. And so if, if, if I'm living with somebody and we each want a share, can we each get a share? Yeah, you can each get a share. But we just get the benefit for the household. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. But what about a corporate membership? Is there such a thing? We have members who are um, business owners. Um, we have members who are uh, educational institutions. Um, but yeah, there's uh, other organizations can become members. Do they have extra ben extra benefits because they put more money in? No, they don't have any extra benefits. They have access to the same benefits that the other members have. So if Nike or or PepsiCo or or Entergy or somebody wanted to get a membership and I wanted to get a membership, we'd be equal. Yeah. <laughs> we each yeah. have one vote. We, we each, each have, have one, one vote. vote. This is thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the profits assuming that there were some would be distributed to the people who, who invested in, in the project yeah. right yeah so there's um there's several different ways it works so right now we're we're doing um, member loan a member loan campaign so members are able to give loans to our uh, our co-op to help launch the biodiesel plant but we're also pre-selling biodiesel and uh, we've set it up kind of like a, a crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. So you can actually be pre-buying a certain amount of biodiesel to use in your diesel vehicle. Um, and then over the course of the next seven years, be able to just drive up to the pump, swipe your member card, and you've already paid for your, for your biodiesel. Okay. Um, and so that's another way we're, we're leveraging funds to help, help us launch. Are you going to offer a uh, seasonal blend, like wintertime uh, Biodiesel and summertime biodiesel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know winter it's, ale. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Well, that's that's um, that's very exciting. Um, Northeast Biodiesel is where where is it located? It's in Greenfield. The plant is in Greenfield, mm -hmm. and and. Um, Whereabouts in Greenfield? Is this is this in an industrial park? Yeah, it's in the Greenfield Industrial Park. We have, you know, like a, a number of years ago, we, we actually built the structure and put in the tanks and the processing system. So we're not starting completely from, from scratch. We have a, we already have the facility built. It's, you know, finishing the, the last construction phase and, and putting our plant into commission and hiring and having the capital to actually process the biodiesel and and ship it out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're located in the in the Greenfield Industrial Park. What is the telephone number of, of, of uh, if somebody wants to get in touch to to be involved in this in this um, fundraising campaign? Sure. So um, the phone number. I'm the outreach and member services manager. I probably should have said that at the very beginning. <laughs> so my my role is to cultivate new members, and you can give me a call. Uh, it's four one three. Three four nine four zero eight four. Mm-hmm. Say it again. So it's four one three <laughs> three four nine four zero eight four. And a person could call you and and then do you take um, donations from people who are non members? And and also I I heard you earlier say that you had supporters. Yeah. A certain number of members and a, and a certain number of supporters. What is that all about? So um you know, we have our community energy co-ops all around the Northeast. Right. And, you know, we've got core members in those areas. But then we have lists of people who, you know, they, they come to our events, they show up to our, our workshops and our trainings. Um, they like to get emails from us and, you know, they're, they're ready. You know, they're, they're almost ready to, to join. You know, we just have to get past this certain hump of launching the biodiesel plant. And then, you know, they'll be ready to, to use more of our products and services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's when we say 7,000 supporters, that's, you know, partner organizations that work with us. It's um, individuals that get our mailings. It's folks who come to our events. Um, yeah, everyone who's not a member yet, but is 
is pretty close. Well, what about a donation? Have you had donations from people? Or just yeah, we've had donations. Um, you know, we can accept donations. I think that, you know, it's what's cool about our cause is that folks, by, by joining and becoming a member, you have more at stake. You have your equity and mm -hmm. um, you can get your products and services back, you know, your energy efficiency stuff on your home. Um, we can help you get a renewable uh, system, solar system, solar hot water, solar hot air mm -hmm. system for your home. Uh, so you, there's a lot of self-interest in there as well that you can actually get stuff out while you know we're contributing a really great um, uh, financial piece to helping us launch the biodiesel plant. And, and actually, if you consider the cost of joining and the benefits that you get, you could save money doing this. Oh, things. absolutely. Yeah. And that is that I think is something that people should, people should understand. The idea of what was the membership cost? Nine hundred and fifty dollars. Nine hundred and seventy five dollars. Nine hundred and seventy five dollars. Sounds like a lot of money. But the savings that you can get by having that involved um, are 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 substantial. Yeah. And could I would imagine you could save $950 in a very short period of time. Yeah, I mean, it's if you have had it in the back of your head of, you know what, I'm really irritated with um, what's going on with climate change. We have to stop using fossil fuels. If that's been lingering in your mind, mm -hmm. it's really a goal of yours. And, you know, by that $975 means you get access to our intellectual capital, you get access to our network. Mm -hmm. um, what is your intellectual capital? You know, it's you know all the time that our our volunteers and, and staff have spent examining a lot of different aspects of getting off of fossil fuels. Okay. Like thinking about you know should you replace your windows to make your home more energy efficient? It's an interesting question. You know, we've looked at at it from many different perspectives, and we say no. You know, it's way better to keep your old windows that have been surviving for decades, and um, invest money in getting you know wind certs that you yes. can put in there, and you know the, you get the same R value, and they cost a lot less money. You can spend forty thousand replacing your windows with um, a product that you have to replace in a few years, anyways, because they're not built to last mm -hmm. like the old ones were, mm -hmm. or you can spend five thousand going getting inserts. Um, for all your windows in your home. And the other thing, another thing that comes up a lot when we talk to, to members are folks who are, um, just don't have the time to, to know what's the right thing to do. That's a big question. We, we get folks who come up to us all the time and say, I just wanna know what's the right thing to do. Do I switch from home heating oil to natural gas? Mm -hmm. We've been hearing that a lot. And you know, we've come out with a very strong position saying, do not, you should not switch from home heating oil to natural gas. First of all, home heating oil companies are mostly family businesses and natural gas is, is corporately owned. That's a very good point. So there's that point. Plus, you know, if you look at, if you mix home heating oil with um, a 20% uh, biodiesel, it burns cleaner than natural gas. So if that's the thing that you're really, that's mm -hmm. motivating you because you hear natural gas is cleaner. But if you look at the extraction of natural gas and you see the amount of methane that gets released when oh. they do hydraulic fracturing, yeah. you know, it, it really is not, is not a benefit for, um, from an ecological standpoint. And when you're a customer of natural gas, you're, natural gas, you're paying for an expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. These pipelines that are being presented to pass through um, New England, through Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and I, is Vermont as well? Vermont, we're fighting. I'll, there are a lot of people in Vermont fighting against it. Yeah, so it's like as a customer of natural gas, you are paying for an expansion of that infrastructure. Right. So, why don't we pay for an expansion of renewable infrastructure? Yes. And not even, you know, if the, the thing we've heard from the Massachusetts governor of why we need another pipeline is, oh, there's increased demand. Well, that demand comes from when folks trans, um, switch from home heating oil to natural gas. So home heating oil systems can run on biodiesel mm -hmm. by creating an alternative that, you know, we're- Which is, which is produced locally. Locally right? and no. its own locally. You know, yeah. we're yeah. cutting off that, that demand that's driving the, the need for um, pipelines. We're going to have to call it quits here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to edit a little bit out of the show. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you for joining us, folks. Thank, thank you guys so much. It was great to meet you. Enjoy and thank you, you so much, much for bringing us on the show. Come and on back, you hear? Yeah, <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us on the show, everybody who's watching.